Hi guys. Today we're going to learn a little bit about wool. Um, so here we go. Wool, of course, comes from sheep. Um, typically, but um, as we'll learn in our next lesson, uh, we can get wool from a variety of different animals. Um, but typically, our wool fabric is going to come from sheep. Uh, specifically, you know, uh, sheep's bred for this. These are some merino sheep. Super fluffy, super cute. So let's get started. Um, the properties of wool, it's very, very warm. It's the warmest of our fibers. Actually, the insulation properties of wool are very, very strong. Um, that's why we see it used a lot in, you know, very uh, high quality winter coats and things like that. Um, it's dirt resistant, so um, something about the fibers uh, of the animal um, sort of shake off or sort of release, they don't stick to dirt. Um, so you can easily brush it off or it sort of just sort of falls off, um, which makes it a little bit stain resistant. Um, wool is very heat sensitive, so it is prone to shrink, um, but this can give it a lot of interesting properties when working with it. Um, you can almost sculpt it um, when used properly, but of course when not used properly, it can, can cause all kinds of problems. Uh, and this is also the reason why you want to be very careful when you iron wool. Uh, put it on lower settings and things like that. It can burn or it can uh, warp um, very, very easily due to heat. The other unfortunate aspect of wool is it tends to pill um, after repeated washes and wearing. So the fibers uh, themselves, after with uh, friction from being worn or washed, uh, will kind of come off and ball into these sort of little fuzz balls that we call pills. Um, and certain wools are more uh, prone to do this than others. The other thing before we begin, before we begin is to talk about worsted wool. And uh, that is going to come into play into our next category, which is going to be suiting fabrics made from wool. Uh, and most suiting fabrics are made from worsted wool. So worsted tends uh, to be kind of a half category of wool. So half of wools, you know, can be classified as worsted. Half of them can be classified as sort of woolen or normal. So the difference between worsted and maybe your normal wool yarn is the worsting process um, not only uses longer raw fibers, so um, um, a, actual hairs from the sheep that are tend to be a bit longer, um, they're combed very intensively, and you can see this sort of, this is an old style of combing uh, that people used to do by hand. Of course, now it's done by big machines, um, but all the fibers are combed very intensely, so they all go straight out and parallel, and they're all lined up very nicely and neatly with one another. This allows them uh, to be spun into a finer uh, yarn and typically they're spun into quite tight yarns, very tight, fine yarns. And when they're woven, it typically creates a stronger, finer, smoother fabric than our other quote unquote woolen yarns, which don't undergo such intense combing and typically uses shorter fiber yarns. Um, typically, whenever you see a lightweight wool, it's made from worsted wool. Uh, again, because this process allows us to spin finer, tighter, smaller yarns um, than our typical woolen yarns, which are um, kind of fuzzier and thicker. Wool suiting fabrics, and like I said, um, this is really where our worsted wools shine. Uh, like the category of shirting fabrics as well, suiting category, uh, the suiting fabrics category really uh, refers to a wide type of fabrics uh, that are traditionally met, met, create, uh, traditionally used to create men's and, and women's suits. Um, not just men's suits, I should have changed that, but men's and women's suits, but traditionally the suit was for a man, so. Boucle. So boucle is often used for ladies' suits or jackets and can resemble tweed because of its sort of rough and bubbly texture. Um, it is characterized by small loops that kind of pop up from the face of the fabric to create this sort of subtle, bubbly or pebbly texture. Um, sometimes it can be quite subtle, sometimes it can be uh, very, very prominent depending on the size of the yarns used. 
Uh, boucle means loop in French, which is where the fabric gets its name. And the loops can, loops can look similar um, uh, to the loops in terry cloth. Um, however, the loops in boucle are always on the face side and a lot of times more sparsely sort of um, arranged onto the fabric. Again, sometimes they can be quite, quite thick. And again, in that situation, it might look quite a, light, quite a lot like um, terry cloth. Flannel. So flannel is something that we've all heard of, but um, probably misunderstand in a couple of ways. So a lot of times people get the um, impression that flannel refers to a sort of plaid pattern. Uh, that's not true. The plaid pattern is independent of the flannel. It is often um, in some of its version uh, woven with a plaid pattern, but not always. Uh, so flannel can refer to either a plain weave or twill weave that has been brushed after weaving to raise up some fibers to create a fuzzy feel. Now this is a specific type of fu uh, finish, the brushing finish. Um, it's similar to our uh, stone or sand washing of our denim um, where it's applied after weaving and it's used to sort of uh, um, soften the fabric, uh, create a, a softer feel. What happens is uh, we take these brushes with these very tiny sort of wire um, fingers in the brush and they brush the surface of the fabric. Um, it'll start to pull up some of the fibers used in the yarn and kind of create this little fuzzy halo. Uh, we'll call it a nap. Uh, flannel is traditionally always brushed like this. Um, and it started out as solely a wool fabric, but it can be found in cotton and also synthetic fibers today and also blended fibers, of course. Um, you can use worsted yarns or woolen yarns uh, to create this fabric. If you're gonna use woolen yarns, you typically end up with a thicker, fluffier fabric like we see in these shirts. Um, it's also popular for pajamas or anything you want to be warm and soft and comfortable. Um, when it is made in worsted uh, yarns, however, uh, we typically see it in a, a very commonly used fabric used for uh, suits. And again, it's a little bit thinner uh, and they typically tend to brush it a little bit less when the flannel is worsted and made for suits. Uh, but of course, we can make suits, pants, and tailored jackets out of it. Gabardine. So gabardine is a classic suiting fabric. It is always made with worsted wool yarns uh, woven into a fine twill. It is smooth, has a dull sheen, and you can find gabardine in a variety of weights. It's typically a little bit more on the soft and limp side than it is stiff, but it's not super watery or flowy. Um, it is lightweight, thin, and uh, quite sort of small, soft and smooth. Houndstooth and herringbone. So these two fabrics really refer to any fabric woven with two or more colors to and, uh, create a special pattern using what's called a broken twill weave. Um, so these broken twills are basically just variations of our standard twill weave that sort of rearrange or reverse or shift the twill pattern to create, you know, these pleasing uh, other sort of designs. Uh, these two patterns are very commonly used and seen all the time, although we can make many different sort of shapes and patterns using a broken twill technique. Um, again, these fabrics can be found in almost any different fiber, so long as they are uh, showing this specific weave patterning, especially highlighted with the contrasting yarn colors. But originally, uh, these were used uh, for woolen gar uh, fabrics, and we can typically see them in suits and jackets and pants and skirts and all things like that. Um, so over here is the hound's tooth. Um, we can also see this in what's called a hound's tooth check. So it's almost like stripes, uh, stripes in a twill. So yarn dyed stripes in a twill that when they come together in the sort of check or plaid pattern, the intersections will create this hound's tooth pattern. The herring uh, bone here is a, is a very simple example of our broken twill patterning where you can see the twill simply goes one way and then the diagonal ribbon simply goes another way at a certain point. And of course these uh, two get their name from resembling 
uh, what they purport to resemble, I guess. Houndstooth uh, sort of looks like a, a dog's canines. Um, it's a bit of a stretch, I will, I will say. Uh, but the herringbone, you can see, so herringbone is like the uh, fish of a skeleton. Uh, you have the spine and the little ribs coming out there, and if you look at a, sh a fish skeleton, you can definitely see that. Tropical suiting. So as its name suggests, this fabric tries to make wool comfortable in warm climates, which is a difficult task, of course, because wool is very, very warm, uh, very, very insulative. Uh, so it's typically not used for summer collections or um, in even uh, warm locations. Um, however, this fabric does try its best. So if you want to wear a suit uh, in the you know warmer climates, I would definitely suggest a linen suit. Uh, but if you have to make it wool, you have to uh, or want to use a tropical suiting. So it makes it a little bit lighter and airier by um, using very very fine worsted yarns, typically two ply. Remember that means that it's two finer yarns spun together. And it's woven in a uh, slight open weave, so it spaces the yarns just a little bit to give a little bit of space, a little bit of breathability uh, between our uh, yarns and our fabric. So again, it's, it helps make it a little bit breathe, breathable. Um, air can pass through it a little bit easier. And tropical suiting is always lightweight. That's the goal, and it's kind of soft and slightly limp. It tends to be a little bit softer and limper um, than our other suiting fabrics. Tweed, uh, probably the most famous and recognizable suiting fabric, and it has a lot of character, of course. Um, tweed is usually a twill, uh, but it can be found in uh, different plain weave variations. It is always woven with yarns that feature knots and slubs. So slubs refer to a uh, yarn that is not even in thickness. So typically when you take out a yarn, it's kind of even all the way across, it's the even size. Uh, but slub yarn typically has um, sort of large bumps, uh, parts of the yarn that are a little bit fatter, a little bit thinner. Um, and again, when you weave it, it gives you a kind of very bumpy, rough, uh, pebbly texture. Um, tweeds are typically heavy in weight, and often uh, yarns of many color or a regular color are used. So when I mean uh, a regular color, they're sort of dyed one color, but um, a little bit of the yarn may have taken it a little bit more, might be darker, a little bit lighter. So you get, um, typically one of the characteristics of tweed is you get a very rich sort of fuzzy color with a lot of different colors in it. Lighter colors, darker, it's, it's fuzzy, it's a soft color, it's not a solid color. And again, a lot of times, especially um, when we make tweeds for ladies jackets, um, we really layer in the color. We use lots and lots of different colored yarns. Um, so you get this sort of beautifully rich, soft color with a lot of different undertones and, and, and colors peeking through and blending uh, with one another. It's quite pleasant. Coating fabric. So that wraps up our suiting fabrics and we're gonna look at one of the other wool staples, which is coating fabrics. Um, so just like with suiting fabrics or shirting fabrics, coating fabrics are really just a general term for fabrics used for these typical garments. Um, they're really characterized by their thickness, their warmth, and again that's where wool shines because we are able to create such um, thick, warm fabrics. Um, again, excellent for winter wear, excellent for staying warm. Our first coating fabric is an interesting one. Um, and we'll see a little bit more of this. Uh, so wool has some very interesting characteristics that let you do some very fun things with it. Um, and this is one of the things that are really very unique, uh, or fabrics that are really very unique that really takes advantage of the characteristics of wool. So boiled wool doesn't really get boiled, like we don't just stick it in a vat of water and boil it, but it does get steamed very intensely. Um, and it gets steamed after its construction has already been made. And what makes this fabric so unique, um, even though I'm doing an, uh, you know, a separate knit section, we haven't done very many knits, we're focusing on wovens, this is a knit fabric. Um, the wools, uh, the woolen yarns, woolen yarns are used um, to create this fabric and they're knit, they're not woven. However, after the fabric is knit, 
it goes through this intense steaming process which makes the wool shrink down and condense and sort of um, uh, really just get compacted in on one another. Um, during this, or after this process, um, uh, the wool will not shrink any further, so it's sort of a pre-shrunk method, um, but also it creates a very dense and thick property, so all that wool is sort of collapsing in on each other, and it's creating this very dense, very warm, very thick fabric. Um, however, this takes out most of the stretch that the knit has given it. So remember, we get stretch out of knit because it's sort of a yarn that is looped upon itself. And those loops have a little bit of give to it. Every little knit stitch has a little bit of give um, from how much that we can pull that little loop. But after it's been shrunk down, we get only the, just the tiniest bit of stretch left. And we really have to treat bo uh, boiled wool more as a woven fabric uh, than a knit fabric. And certainly it feels and performs much more like a woven, non-stretch fabric. Um, uh, also, two boiled wools are usually uh, made out of merino wool. Just because merino wool has a, a higher capacity for shrinkage, so it makes it more um, ideal for this sort of application. Double cloth. So double cloth is another interesting one. So this fabric is really any fabric that is woven together using the double cloth technique. Um, it originally started uh, with wool fabrics, but again, we can really make a double cloth with any variety of different fabrics. It is essentially sort of two different fabrics um, stuck one on top of the other. Um, and we can use this um, either just to increase the density of a fabric, the density and thickness of a fabric, or we can use it to create sort of reversible or double-sided fabrics as well. So a true double cloth is essentially um, two quote-unquote separate fabrics uh, that have their own warp and weft yarns. And then they are woven together using a third set of weft yarns. And again, this can give the uh, impression that sort of two fabrics are sort of glued on top. They're not, of course, glued. They're woven with that extra set of yarns. They're typically very warm uh, and heavy, and they can be medium to thick. So again, if you use this double cloth method with two lighter weight fabrics, you only really end up with a medium. Um, but then, of course, if you can imagine, you can get quite thick fabrics as well creating this. Um, they typically are pretty expensive too, so it's kind of like a two-in-one deal. You're really paying for two fabrics in one, so they tend to be um, a little bit more expensive. Felt. Now, felt is a really interesting and unusual fabric that um, you can actually do a lot of amazing things with. Um, so it's interesting because it's neither knit, nor woven, nor is it a skin. Um, so all of our other fabrics, other than felt, belong in at least one of those categories. Of course, our knits, our wovens, and then if you have a fur or a leather, it's a skin. Um, but not felt. Felt is all on its own. So instead of being spun into yarns, in fact, we'd never even make a yarn for felt, uh, we just take the fibers, we sort of lay them out, and we press them, we heat them, and we sort of agitate them by sort of rubbing them all together. Um, and this causes the fibers to kind of tangle up. That's the agitation and pressing. And then when we add heat, they sort of shrink down and kind of knot and, and bond to each other. Um, after the process, this really forms a dense mat um, that is basically what fa uh, felt fabric is made out of. Uh, this means that felt fabric, again, being unique, has no grain and will not fray. It can also be steamed and shaped into uh, almost any shape. Um, so if we have specific molds when we are heating and pressing and agitating, um, we will get a basically a felt shaped um, uh, or a felt, um, we can, sorry, we can press that felt into that shape. And that's how we can make hats or different things. So we can really sort of form um, and almost mold felt in the process of making it, which makes it very interesting. Um, kind of gets a bad name uh, because we are very used to seeing some cheap felts. Uh, you know, in the craft store, we see very, very cheap felts that are dry and they break apart even uh, very easily. 
but really high quality felts can be made to ma uh, can be used to make some very nice clothing. They're very warm, they're very durable, um, they're thick and plush, and they could be quite soft. Um, so don't let the cheap felts out there get, let felt get, uh, get a bad name. It can be quite a nice fabric, feel nice, and perform very nicely. Loden cloth. Now, loden cloth is a very sort of specific fabric um, that uh, really originates mostly out of its tradition. So it was traditionally um, worn in Austria um, uh, in the mountainous district of the loaderers, um, hence its name, the loden cloth. Um, and it is uh, very much like Melton, which is the next one in our category. Um, it's usually blended with uh, other fibers, so wool and other fibers, traditionally mountain goat, but today we can use synthetics, uh, camel hair, mohair, alpaca, all sorts of different things. Um, but it can be uh, woven in a plain weave or twill, um, but it is always brushed uh, very heavily after weaving to raise up again that characteristic dense nap that we saw in flannel. Um, so much so that it typically obscures the weave, so um, it might look a little bit like flannel. Um, typically, loden cloth, after the um, nap has been brushed up, will shave it down. So it remains kind of soft, um, but it's not so fuzzy. Uh, and this can also help reduce the amount that it's going to pill. Traditionally, loden cloth was dyed a very dark green color, but can come in any color today. So our next is Melton, and again, these are very uh, similar, uh, so much that you can really call Loden cloth a type of Melton, um, although Loden cloth tends to be specific and true Loden cloth uh, should be made in Germany or Austria. Uh, Melton can be really be made anywhere. Um, and again, it's similar because it's a thick uh, 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 woolen woven, uh, always with a twill, um, and it's obscured by that heavy brushed finish. Um, so this is a very warm wool fabric and it's super durable and its finish can really make it feel as soft as velvet. So we really, if you get a really nice high quality wool, uh, weave it into this melt in, brush it quite a bit, quite nicely. Um, it's super soft and velvety. So that concludes our uh, wool cloths for today. So we did suiting and we did uh, coating cloths. Uh, tomorrow we're gonna come back, or I'm sorry, uh, Thursday, we're going to come back and we're gonna talk about some other wools that don't really fit in either of these categories. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about um, some specialty wools from uh, other animals uh, other than sheep. And again, there's actually a surprising amount of them. Um, so I'll see you then. Also, please check the assignment section. I have posted um, information on the next collection project. Uh, so be sure to uh, check that. And I'll see you tomorrow. Thursday. Bye-bye. <laughs>